The Rebel Capitalist Show. Focusing on energy, uh, I've I've talked to a good buddy of mine who runs a hedge fund. His name is Chris McIntosh. And he was saying, you know, George, in the future, especially with oil and maybe coal or maybe even gold, I know Russell Napier was talking about that the other day on Macro Voices. But he said, typically in a free market, the cure for high prices is high prices. But he said, I don't know if that's going to play out in the future because we just because it's the political narrative maybe it's the right thing to do it's i'm not going to get into that debate but there's so little capital going into creating more supply of these commodities that uh it doesn't matter how high the price is going to go there's still not going to be any more supply come online to create that equilibrium how do you see that moving forward uh well if you look at the capex in um in this sector right now then it's almost at a 20 year low. Right. Um, and I think the reason is that uh, a lot of funds, uh, a lot of investment managers have moved their mandates towards uh, ESG mandates. Yeah, that, that's uh, so what it's I was implying, yeah. Uh, yeah it's, it's essentially very tricky uh, to attract capital to this sector at the moment. Uh, I, I hope that the current crisis that we are basically standing right at uh, in the middle of here in Europe and uh, also in China uh, will at least temporarily reverse that trend. But I'm not sure because if you look at the response from politicians, they basically just tell people that they will um, put up more windmills as a consequence of this, right? Yeah. Um, and and I'm, I'm not sure that um, that strategy will... Um, Will, pr- will be proven right uh, over the coming decade, but uh, at least it's still the strategy that most politicians are following. Yeah. So w- how do you think that plays into commodity prices over the next, uh, let's say, three years or so? Because I, I know commodity prices, at least, um, uh, was it? I believe iron ore has really taken a hit because of what's happening in China. I think they represented uh, about 50% of global demand yeah. So companies like Rio Tinto, where I think that's about 40% of their uh, revenue, uh, you know, they've obviously taken a hit, but I was just trying to think, okay, you know, copper's come down a bit, maybe nickel's come down a bit because of what's happening in China. Is that maybe some a headwind short term, but we've got to look at the bigger picture and say there's a lot more tailwind long term? Yeah, I think there's uh, a lot more tailwind long term for mm-hmm. uh, for such commodities. But I think you're also right that um, the latest price developments, they are clearly linked to what's going on in the uh, commercial real estate sector in China, because uh, if construction activity is down, then these uh, commodities will also take a hit. Uh, one, one thing that could um, play a, an important part in the pricing of, for example, copper as well, is that windmills, solar panels, um, all of these uh, renewable uh, energy sources, they require a lot of copper. Um, yeah, right. Uh, and and uh, if politicians, they uh, will keep pursuing this uh, renewable strategy, then we should expect that uh, demand to pick up markedly in the next decade. Mm. Uh, so so I, I would argue structurally that we've entered a bullish scenario for, for commodities, but I'm not, I'm not too uh, bullish industrial short term due to what's going on in China. I think we will have lower commodity prices in, uh, in the exact sector that you just uh, asked for uh, in a year from now, maybe 20, 25% even. Do you think that will materially affect the inflation rate in the US and, and uh, Europe? Well, on a headline basis, yes, uh, but I think we will move from sort of a supply chain driven inflation scenario right now to a waged price spiral next year, mm. uh, given what we see from leading indicators on wage growth. Uh, we we saw how the wage growth exploded in the U.S. Uh, during the latest quarter. Uh, we've also seen tendencies towards the same in uh, in Europe. Uh, so we will see inflation from the labor markets next year, not from commodities. And historically, hasn't that been the main catalyst to sustained levels of inflation? Definitely. I I think that a lot of what has created 
the inflation, in my opinion, has been these economic distortions created by the U.S. government. And mm -hmm. I don't see those distortions going away. I think that they will actually increase in the future. Uh, they, they, they won't decrease. But as far as, um, let's just assume for a moment that inflation does continue to uh, stay at, at high levels in the United States or in Europe, uh, what is the next move for the central banks? Uh, let's just assume that inflation gets up to a level where it's really putting the squeeze on the average Joe and Jane to the point where they're cognizant of it and they're really uh, making noise. Uh, what does the central bank do then? Uh, also understanding that there's so much debt out there at a sovereign level, a corporate level, and uh, a consumer level that raising interest rates significantly could impact the overall economy, maybe even more so asset prices. Well, there, there is no way that they will allow real rates to turn positive again uh, right. due to the current debt load. Uh, I think it's the only uh, sort of politically palatable solution long term um, it is to just keep uh, real rates negative for as long as needed to bring debt levels in uh, in real terms down. Mm. Um, so of course, if you get 10% inflation, let's just assume that, um, then I would argue that they could raise nominal rates, but they will still have to keep real rates as low as they are now. Uh, so that will be the threshold. They will keep, have to keep real rates very, very low and clearly in negative territory. There is no way out of it. I'd like to get your view on this idea that Joseph Wang had. And yeah. so ho hopefully I can, I can do justice to it here with my summary. But basically, he, he pointed out the fact that the system the commercial banks have or the relationship with the Fed has changed significantly uh, since the GFC. Prior to the GFC, the, the money markets, basically, the banks would lend to each other. And if the Fed wanted the interest rate to go down or up, they would just buy some more treasuries or more or mortgage securities or sell them. And that would provide the more dollars. The more dollars there are, the interest rate that goes down or the more liquidity it is for banks to lend to one another. But when you do QE, you flush the system with all of these reserves. So uh, regardless of what you want the interest rate to be, it would be at zero. Uh, there's really no way for the Fed to increase uh, interest rates if they're doing quantitative easing at the same time. So the solution to that was IOER or IOR, interest on reserves. So then regardless of, of what uh, or how much liquidity is in the system, how many bank reserves are out there, Bernanke says, we'll pay you 1%, we'll pay you 2%, or, or, and I'm just using Bernanke as an example. So therefore the banks are incentivized to only lend money at a rate higher than the Fed is paying them for their reserves, which is basically a risk-free rate, if you will. Mm. Uh, so he says, since that dynamic has changed, the banks are no longer competing with one another for deposits. Because prior to that, they're competing for deposits because that was the cheapest form of reserves they could get. Yeah. But, but now there is no competition because they don't really need any more reserves. They got all they can handle. You know, the amount of reserves in the system has gone from, call it 40 billion to up over 4 trillion. So yeah. His theory is that if they raised IOER even up to five or six percent, let's say, the interest rate they're paying the customers still around maybe 20, 30 basis points. And therefore, that, that delta is all profit that's going to the banks and additional bank reserves. So what do they do with that? They try to get a little bit bigger return. So they go out and buy treasuries. But he said, since the United States right now is having an issue with the debt ceiling, Assuming they continue to have the problem moving forward, that means Janet Yellen is issuing fewer bonds that the Fed is able or that those banks are able to buy. If they're able to buy fewer bonds and they're going to go into the private sector, and if the banks buy bonds or assets from the, the private sector, the non-bank entities, that is increased money creation because the, the, that's creating dollars that didn't exist before. And then he went back to that chart of the, the dollars uh, in the deposit accounts of households just going parabolic up to trillion. And he says that if interest rates rise because the bank's buying assets from non-bank entities with their additional profit, that could increase the amount of dollars circulating in the real economy. 
do you yeah. have a, a view on that? I, I think that thesis is fair. Uh, and it's probably exactly why the Federal Reserve is so keen on removing excess reserves uh, during a process of rate hikes. Right. We saw that in 2018, 2019, right? And it ended with a big bang. Um, but essentially, they wanted to withdraw liquidity or excess reserves from banks in the uh, in the process of, of raising interest rates uh, due to fearing this exact mechanic. Um, so they haven't really told us whether they intend to um, to experiment with withdrawing liquidity again this time around. Right now, they withdraw liquidity via the uh, reverse repo. Uh, because without that, we would have had massively negative interest rates in the U.S. already now. Mm. Um, that that's kind of flooring the interest rate levels at uh, at, at five basis points. Yeah, right. Since the Fed is 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 uh, is paying that, right? And just to be um, clear, you're, Andreas, you're talking about reverse repo, where the Fed is the counterparty. So we have all these money yes, market yeah. funds that are flushed with those dollars that we just talked about, and they're yeah. taking those dollars and instead of parking them, or instead of them being liabilities of commercial banks, they park them at the Fed, so they're liabilities on the Fed's balance sheet. Yeah. So that's one way of actually withdrawing the uh, liquidity or the excess reserves without having to withdraw the, uh, the excess reserves mm. permanently. Uh, so I actually think that uh, the um, introduction of the reverse repo and the uh, increase of counterparty levels um, has solved part of the issue that Joseph lists here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I'm not as scared of it as I, uh, as I was in 2018. Um, but it's still a struggle for the Fed because obviously they need to think of ways to remove liquidity into a, a rate hiking scenario because otherwise they won't get rates up. Right. So with this environment that is, I think, becoming maybe more obvious to the average uh, talking head at CNBC or maybe fund manager, what is going on with gold? <laughs> it's a big puzzle. Um, I, 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 the only concrete explanation I can come up with is that uh, we've seen an introduction of digital gold <laughs> and, right. and that's maybe the, the, the right reason why it's not performing because if you look at current real rate levels then I would argue that gold should trade at least above 2000 uh, mm. but it's not yeah uh, so I mean historical correlations they've broken uh, we simply have to admit that yeah. So do you, what do you see? Do you see that correlation uh, being broken longer term or just being kind of a shorter term anomaly? Well, uh, let me put it like this. If, uh, if I were to construct a portfolio, uh, then I would like to have a bit of gold in the portfolio to protect myself against the scenario where we reintroduce the gold standard. Mm. Uh, but I would also like to have a bit of uh, digital assets in my portfolio to protect myself against the scenario where we actually link the monetary policy to a digital asset, right? Right. Uh, so I think the probability of returning to the gold standard is much lower today than before uh, the digital digital assets. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's one reason why we've seen this decorrelation between real rates and gold, that the probability of returning to the gold standard is now lower. Or right. the probability of, of entering into a Bitcoin standard, if, if, if I may. So the probability maybe is increasing that we could get a, a Bitcoin standard and maybe decreasing slightly that the next phase is a, a gold standard when the fiat uh, regime kind of comes crashing down. Yeah, I, I basically think that's uh, the rationale be, be behind portfolio construction right now. And, and that's essentially why we see the price action that we do. Awesome.